Oh, we're on. Oh, good morning, church. And good morning, Facebook Live. It's kind of weird that I'm on a timer. It's kind of awkward. Anyways, top of the morning to you guys. It's a little cool in here, but that's all right. We're going to stand up and we're going to sing and we're going to get warmed up real quick. Amen? Amen. God is good. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour right out, turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me and the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Those pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour right out, turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, and blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering this morning.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good. Church, here we go. Sing it out. You're never going to let me go. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good, good. Oh. God, we just thank you for today, Lord, and you are so good. Father God, you are faithful. Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, be with us in our worship time together today, Lord. I just pray that you would uh, allow us just to experience you in a mighty way today, God, and that we just might have this uh, freedom in our worship today, Lord, uh, just to lift you up and to exalt you, Father God. Lord, we're here because of you, and we're here for you, and we want to just give our, um, our, our, our worship to you. Lord, and our sacrifice of praise. And just, we just want to lift you up this morning, God, because you are good. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again, sing it again, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be, that you, my King, would die for me? 
amazing love I know is true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I church amazing love amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love i know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all Is he your king this morning? You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you are my king. You are my king. So here I am to worship, 
King that saves us, powerful and full of love. You are the King that gave us life with every drop of blood. Jesus, the Lamb of God, Savior and King, you alone are worthy of our praise forever, you alone are seated church you alone Father God, we just uh, thank you. Yes, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this time of worship, Lord. We just pray now that you would um, open up our hearts, Lord, and our understanding, Father, to receive from your word this morning, God. And we just ask that you would uh, just be with those who are not well physically, Lord. I just pray a healing upon uh, those today, Father God. Lord, continue to watch over us as, uh, as this virus just really um, is taking off, Father God. And Lord, we're so thankful that that you are good and that you have um, washed over us, Father God. And so we pray for those who uh, need healing today. We pray that you would uh, extend your hand, Father God, and, and that you would just touch them this morning, Father God. Lord, we just pray now that you would anoint Pastor uh, Jerry, Father, as he comes forward. God, that you would just uh, speak through him, Lord, and uh, may your words really just uh, take, take residence in our hearts today, Father God. We love you, we thank you, and we just give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do not see Aaron. Who's going to do announcements this morning? Jackie? Okay, Jackie, come forward, please. Uh, go ahead and greet somebody this morning. Is everybody okay? Right on. Uh, ooh, that's loud. Uh, I don't know what the announcements are. Aaron's not here today. Um, choir next next weekend is choir thing. Choir practice after church, of course. And uh, there was something else that I thought. Oh, our so here's the schedule for this year. Um, not being closed. Um, Christmas Eve service. We, 5.30, the, the choir is going to share and sing. We'll do some quick prayer and devotional and then get you on to your families and whatnot um, for, for Christmas Eve this year. Um, New Year's Eve, <clears throat> uh, Lori's heading up a night of prayer uh, for people to come and go as they please. She's planning on being here from 10 p.m. until 7 a.m. So awesome, great. 
Um, if you want to come out for that, if you, you know, come out and pray. I, yeah, you can come and go either way. So what, um, I don't know, what else is going on around here? Christmas. I was, I wanted to have, I wanted to have one all church service on Christmas, but um, it's just not going to happen. We'll just continue to be wise. With, with that being said, just uh, remember, just continue to be wise, sanitize, wear a mask if you're walking around the hallways or whatever. I think we're spread out enough right now, you know, but if you need to wear a mask, please do. Uh, we're not um, enforcing anything, obviously, but just be wise, you know, let's be careful. Um, so far, God has been good and protected protected us quite well, so I'm not worried about too much, um, but, you know, it's also flu season and winter season. How anybody would get the flu after wearing a mask for nine months, I don't know, but we'll see. Um, yeah, stranger things have happened. So let's uh, turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 together. We'll stand as we read God's word today. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your, in your own control? Why have you con Receive this thing in your heart. You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Father, I, I pray today that as we look at this uh, account from the early church, that we would have the right perspective, that we would understand that you are a holy God and you do expect honesty and real uh, worship in your church and among your people. Lord, we're so thankful that your grace covers our sin. We're so thankful that this isn't the normal uh, Sunday for us to have people dropping down because they sinned. Lord, you're so good, but also help us remember that you are holy and we are called to be holy as well. We pray for this morning's tithes and offerings as we look at the subject today as well. Lord, um, continue to bless this church, bless us, convict us where need be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. <clears throat> We're moving along nicely in the book of Acts. A father gave his little girl two dollars and said, you can do anything you want with one of the dollars, but the other dollar belongs to God. So with great joy, she ran to the candy store. Well, on the way, she tripped and one dollar fell into a storm drain. When she got up and brushed herself off, she said, well, Lord, there goes your dollar. Listen, God has been gracious and faithful, and He has given us His very best. He has given us His only Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to pay the sin debt that we owed that we could never pay. All He asks of us is to give ourselves to Him in reasonable service for the gospel 
and the expansion of his kingdom in this world. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. This comes from, uh, in many forms. Service, serving the Lord. Time, selfless actions, mature growth. And, well, quite frankly, even in our finances. And it's interesting because is finances is one area that many uh, Christians struggle with giving over to the Lord. You know, we don't talk about tithes and offerings here. In fact, I forget to pray about it most of the time. You know, we have our box in the side and in the back in the fellowship hall, and God takes care of us. But when we come to a passage like this, we're going to talk about it. We're going to deal with it. You know, each, each of these, um, the Bible has a lot to say about this area, especially finances. Our passage today speaks about this uh, from two angles, one glorious and one frightening each of these has great instruction and encouragement, but there's still a warning for us to heed. The question we will be asked today is, how are we doing in this area of our finances as members of the Lord's church? Now, so far in the book of Acts, we have seen the Holy Spirit very actively at work in the church. Great miracles are happening. Great power is being poured out upon the apostles and the disciples and among the people. The excitement is almost electric in the air. If you recall the reaction there, we looked at uh, midweek service, uh, the crippled man at the temple gate that we saw last week, well, he went into the temple leaping and praising while well, the religious leaders were having none of it. They, they came down heavy on the, on the church, on the apostles. They said, by the, by the end of the, the, them coming down, Peter preached a second sermon, sec, two, second of eight sermons preached in the book of Acts. 5,000 souls came to Christ that day. Well, the church was growing. Great grace, it says in chapter 4. Great grace was being poured out upon the people. But today we're going to see that the, even among the great grace, great fear was also coming because God was going to make sure that his church was pure from the beginning. You know, it would take several years and decades and now millennia for the church to, to be corrupted. But at that point, God was being, well, I guess the word is protective over his church. The church is growing. And we're going to see how comforting that is. Look at verse 32 of chapter 4. Because you've got to get the context to finish out chapter 4 here. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. We read here that the early church was of one heart and soul. They came together, they made sure that all the people were fed, they had jobs if they were able to work, they had fellowship, encouragement, we saw that in chap chapter 2, but now it's expanded upon here at the end of chapter 4. Listen, this was how God intended his people to be from ancient times, and it was simply the fullest expression of God's commandment in Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. Where, where they were uh, supposed to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then love their neighbor as himself. That would be poured out from the people. If you are loving God with everything that you have, then the natural outflow of that in your life is to love others the way that God loves them. We've seen that several times. In fact, Jesus uh, brings that up in, in the Gospels. Matthew 22 is an example. The Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, and they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, this is Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, uh, they said, or thir yeah, 34 through 40, then one of them, a lawyer, asked a question, testing him, saying, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Jesus summed up the entirety of the Old Testament by these two things, loving the Lord, loving the neighbor. It's interesting today to see mankind 
try to shadow God's commandment to feed the poor, yet they reject Jesus Christ as the very God who gave them the command to begin with. This is why so many social programs fall when they are devoid of the Holy Spirit. You know, just thinking uh, about uh, the way our society is right now and, you know, the, the paralyzing events of our day. And, you know, many organizations in this town in particular uh, give away gifts at Christmas. And it's a, it, it's a big thing. In fact, the last couple of years, we're competing with other groups in town to make sure that children have pre presents. Well, this year, you know, the, the people that do all that were not able to do it. Salvation Army wasn't even able to do it. And they're a Christian organization. And Toberman and Harbor Interfaith and uh, the fire departments that, that normally do it and Toys for Tots and all those things, they've all been shut down due to regulations and, and, and they're not doing that. But we had a wonderful time giving presents to the community presents to the gift. They're all spoken for now, right? All the presents. We we'll still have a couple left but because some people didn't show up, but that's okay because we're doing it out of the love of Christ for our community and sharing the gospel with the community as they came forward. You know, a lot of social programs do fail. They really do because you know, they try to do something, and yes, a practical need may, might be met, but if it's without the Holy Spirit, with, if it's without the gospel, then it's not going to last. You know, God certainly does maintain the affairs of men, and He uses them to accomplish His purposes, but think of how effective they are when they do rely upon God. In fact, this is a good way to share the gospel with the self-righteous type people. People claim to be good and brag about feeding the poor, but it has no merit because it's the very least that God requires of us anyway. And Jesus has already told us that in the law. You, you, the, the basic requirement, the greatest commandments, love the Lord, love your neighbor. So if you say, I take care of my neighbor, well, good on you. you. You're doing what God told you to do anyway. But where are you with Jesus Christ, the one who died for your sin? Now, I love the next verse, though. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. What a powerful verse this is. And I really, we need to lay hold of this verse before we look into what caused great fear to come into the church. The church was in line with the Spirit of God. The church was moving in great power and receiving God's favor. And His hand of blessing and provision was upon all. Also note that the outcome, this is really important, and this is a model for us to, to remember. Because of the great power that the Lord was pouring out, because of the oneness of heart and soul, because of the way the people were taking care of each other, God's grace was poured out upon the church, and what was the result? With great power, they gave witness to the gospel. And notice, any time in the book of Acts, you really see this. It's witness or speaking or teaching or preaching on the resurrection. To them, Jesus was a lie. Yes, they will reference the cross and being Jesus being crucified, but wherever the gospel seems to be presented in the book of Acts, it's always from the angle of the resurrected Lord, the resurrection. This means that because of everything they were doing, God's Grace was poured out, and their testimony was effective in leading people to Jesus. We've seen 3,000 come to faith during one sermon, 5,000 come to faith during another sermon, and then as you continue to read the book of Acts, it tells us God added daily to the church those who he was saving. Just the people just kept on coming. It's the most important thing of all. The work of the gospel was unhindered because of the combination of the unity of the saints and the grace of God. Christian, let us pray for that. Let's, let's, let's really ask the Lord to be present with us in the preaching of the gospel, in the sharing of the gospel. Our youth group went out. We prayed for them. They went out last uh, Friday night to Seal Beach with Frank and did the open air campaign. And, um, Aaron sent me a picture of the youth group. Our, our kids... 12, 13, 
years old, 14, I think, was, you know, they led, they helped lead seven people to Christ on Friday night. They're getting, they're getting a little taste of what they could do for their generation. Pray that that, they, pray that they get back to school, that they are not scared to share the, the gospel. That's one of the greatest joys is to lead somebody to Christ. If you've led somebody to, to faith in Jesus Christ, you will know that feeling and you'll never, be, you'll never be the same. Realizing that God can use you in the words that you can say out of your mouth to help somebody make a decision and say, yes, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I don't get caught up with all the weird people in the church that are like, oh, false converts and people, you know, there's too many people that make false confessions. You know what? Anybody who opens their mouth and says, I will receive Jesus Christ. The Bible said, what did Peter say in chapter 2? For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. People don't just, you know, the way that the world, or as unfortunately many in the church just have this feeling that there are people just walking around their lives and they say, I'll receive Jesus, and they keep on walking, and it's like it's a false confession. No, it takes a lot for somebody to drop all their pride to get to a point where they will hear a message of the gospel and pray to receive Jesus Christ. Let God continue to do the saving. Let's not be party to those who have a problem with, you know, people coming to faith too much in church. That's what the church is for. That's what the gospel is for. And with great grace, God pours out his spirit through his church. But it gets better than that. Verse 34, nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. You know, because of their unity, they regarded people as more important than things. They recognized God's ownership of everything. It all belonged to God anyway. And if he wanted it redirected for his people, they would just listen to the Holy Spirit and do that. Was this an early form of communism? We kind of looked at that um, a couple weeks ago. No, there, uh, there's a contrast between communism and the koinonia fellowship that the Greek uses here. Uh, one commentator said, communism says, what's yours is mine and I'll take it. Koinonia says, what's mine is yours and I'll share it. Big difference. This is not communism or socialism as some assert. This is simply the response of those who are submitted to God and following Him and seeing the need among their brothers and sisters. Also, uh, the Greek uh, here does not mean that everyone sold their property at, at one time. The way, it really, uh, the way the structure is, it's from time to time this was done as the Lord brought needs uh, to their attention. But it is noteworthy here that here we see the first real description of how the early church began to recognize and submit to the authority of the apostles. Because they would come, they, they were like, well, let's bring this to the apostles. They're running the church, they're in charge of everything. Nowhere do we read that they bow to them or kiss Peter's ring or anything like that. They just recognize the authority of the apostles. The Holy Spirit was directing his people to support the church, the leaders of the church, and to trust them with their goods so that the needs of the people would be met. This is essentially the first time, though, that we see the practice of tithes and offerings done among the church here in the book of Acts. So it gives us an insight to the way the early church worked. They just took care of everybody. That's great. I, I, I keep having to go bring bags into the food pantry. Uh, our food pantry is packed right now. There's a lot of stuff in there. So if you need something, please ask, because it's for the church primarily. It's for us, because there are many of us that maybe need a box of cereal and some, some canned fruit or some beans or rice. We've got tons of stuff in there. If you need something, please ask. It's not a problem at all, because people are bringing it. There are people in your fellowship that are bringing bags of stuff so that those who have need could not go without. All right. This is the setting for which the story of Ananias and Sapphira comes out, though. But first, we're introduced to a man named Barnabas, who will be a, a character in the rest of the book of Acts. And also, uh, 
Joseph, or Joseph would be the equivalent name, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. He was a Levite out of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, in the midst of this great move of God, we read about a man named uh, Joseph, who uh, the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which his name means son of encouragement. This gives us a little uh, about his dis- disposition and how the leaders viewed him. as the, He was a very generous and gracious man. And again, we're going to read a lot about Barnabas. He will go off uh, to be with Paul. He'll be one of Paul's greatest partners in ministry until they have a little falling out over Barnabas's nephew Mark, John Mark. We're going to read about him 25 times in the book of Acts. Apparently, he was a wealthy man. He was also a good Jew and a Levite from the region of Cyprus, which where the Jews had been scattered during the diaspora. And I believe he is singled out here as an example of generosity and openness to be contrasted with the greed and the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. So let's strive to be like Barnabas, okay, before we read about the alternative here, especially as we read here, verse 1, chapter 5. We're going to read through verse 5 or verse 6. And a certain man named Ananias, or Hananiah, if you would look at the Hebrew, and his and with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and be, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Whoa. What just happened there? Well, if you thought that to yourself while reading this passage, you're not alone. This is indeed a very eye-opening story that we read here. Seems out of character, doesn't it? Let's break it down a little bit. In the middle of all this powerful working of God, in the excitement of the newly formed church, this man and his wife conspired to lie about the sale of some land. You know, it's likely that they saw the way people were being treated, that gave big gifts to the church and wanted in on some of the back padding. That's really the consensus of what the scholars think was going on here. And that's why Barnabas' story is kind of told at, right before them. You know, that he got a nice nickname. What are they going to call us? Maybe a little jealous and misinterpreted the thankfulness that Barnabas received as an opportunity uh, to receive equal praise and honor. You know, it's pretty straightforward, though, what happened. In any case, they had pledged that they would sell their land and give all the proceeds to the church. That's really the gist of it. They, they said they were going to give everything like Barnabas had, like many had. Because the story starts with Peter calling Ananias out for a lie, it appears the Holy Spirit had revealed that to him. In fact, Peter says, listen, no one compelled you to do this. We didn't have the thermometer up here with the red line. We were, we, there was no drive for this. Barnabas did it out of the love of his own heart. He's a great guy. We, we recognize that. He's, you know, God's, God's raising him up in ministry. People are giving their needs. They're, they're selling their possessions. Uh, you guys said, hey, I'm going to go sell this land and, and give all the proceeds to God. You ever done that before? I'm gonna, God, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to do it. And then the time comes, like, I mean, that's kind of what they did here. They pledged that they would sell it all and give it all to the church. But when it came right down to it, they, they gave just a little bit. In fact, they, were, they conspired together. Note that. 
This wasn't the right hand not knowing what the left was doing. They conspired together and lie about the real amount. Here it is. We sold it all. We get a little uh, better picture by the Greek word used there for kept back when it says they kept back a portion. That's the word uh, nosfizo in the Greek. It means to misappropriate or embezzle or steal. So there was, they were working some type of scheme here to sell the land and then keep a big portion of it. So they didn't just decide to keep some of the money. Again, they probably pledged a certain amount and they told this is what our land is worth and we're going to sell it and give it all. But they conspired to make more money. So they did some deals on it and then they kept. The story's not quite over yet, though. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. So think about this. Just, just kind of letting your mind think about how this probably played out. Three hours later, no one's told her that her husband has died. She's coming in for women's Bible study, you know, to eat some baby Jesus cupcakes and whatever. She's, she's like got a big smile on her face because she knows that, that when they parted that morning, her husband was going. So she's expecting maybe some praise and a little bit of like, oh, Safira, can you please come sit here today? You know, she's, she's like, you know, like coming in completely unsuspecting. And then Peter shows up. That's why I don't show up to the women's things, you know. I want, I want you guys to relax and just enjoy, you know. Although I like tea. No one ever invites me to get tea. Peter uh, answered her. That word answered her means that Peter, like, hi, how are you? I have, I have a question for you. Oh, yes. Can you imagine the smile on her face? Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. So, again, there's just this idea there that she's like, yes, uh, yeah. You know, like, it's all good. And Peter said to her, how is it that you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. I want you to note here, when you read the story, Peter asked Ananias four questions that expose his sin. Before he can even answer, he is struck dead. Zephira is asked only one question. She is given the chance to tell the truth. I think that knowing the nature of God, it's entirely possible she may have been spared if she had just told the truth and fessed up. Listen, Satan was at work here. Peter says it very clearly. Satan filled Ananias' heart and by proxy his wife, because they are one, filled their heart to lie to God. But they were both active parties. By the way, you can uh, see another proof text for the Trinity there because Peter, see, Peter says, you know, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. So that ties the Holy Spirit and God together. That's a, a Trinity proof text as well. And then, of course, um, Sapphira is told, lie to the Lord. So there's, there's Christ, there's Jesus in the mix there. So the, the whole Trinity is referenced to in this passage. But listen, they were, Satan was at work for sure, but they were active. They listened to him but they acted in their flesh. Satan had not been able to shut the church up about Jesus Christ. That was the context of chapter 4. The church was told, don't speak the name of Jesus again. Come, come, keep coming to the temple, keep praying, doing the prayers and worship and everything, but please don't say anything about the name of Jesus again. And the apostles and the the disciples and the early church they got together. They prayed. The Holy Spirit came in an uh, earthquake and shook the place. And they, they had prayed for boldness to continue to preach the gospel. And that's what they do. So Satan could not shut them up. So now he looks for a way to corrupt the church from within. 
Christian, there is a warning there for us to stay on guard. To stay on guard. Do not let the devil infiltrate the church. Do not let him get through us in any form. Unfortunately, we live at the latter end of history. We live in a time where the devil is running amok around this world, drawing division and strife and anxiety, and he will look for any way he can to bring that into the church who is supposed to be standing in boldness and security, during, especially during a time like this. The church is being used mightily in many areas. And I won't go on about how God has done a great work in this place. But he's always going to look for a way in. Don't be the foothold. Don't let him lie to you and cause you to stumble and then stumble others. But listen, when we read this story, some would say, well, but we're in the age of grace. Isn't God all love and puffy and fluffy marshmallows? And Why does God judge them so harshly? Well, honestly, there's not much variance or disagreement among Bible scholars with this passage. God acted swiftly in the best interest of the church for that time in history. Satan had infiltrated. He had caused lies and deceit to creep in. He brought leaven into the church. And God simply said, no, that's not going to happen. An example needed to be set for them at that time. And that example still should be with us today. God, don't play games. We shouldn't be playing games either. Again, praise God that he doesn't strike down people dead in the middle of service. That would be a little bit awkward. <laughs> Many scholars uh, also see a striking parallel of the story of Ananias and Sapphira with the account of Achan in Joshua 7. In fact, in the Septuagint version, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the, the word, that's the same word is used, uh, Nosfamizai, uh, the kept back, Achan did the same thing. Uh, he conspired, stole, embezzled. There was something shady going on with the way Achan took the items and buried them in his tent. It's the same word that's used. Listen, this was indeed a very shocking example of God swiftly judging among the camp of Israel during the times of Israel's growth. Think about what was going on. The conquest of Canaan and the nation of Israel getting ready to enter into the promised land, and then all of a sudden sin enters the camp. Well, I think what's going on here is that God is saying, is drawing a parallel. The church is new. You know, the Sabbath rest now in Christ Okay, the, the people coming to faith in Christ have now entered into the land. We will not have sin in the camp, which, by the way, is always a good reminder. Don't allow sin in the camp. We all struggle with sin, you guys. Every, every one of us has things that we're dealing with. Don't bring them into the church. Don't let your liberty, which a lot of times is just sin, don't let that cause others to stumble. Let the Lord work it out. Let the Lord deal with those things. But don't, don't bring it into the church. It's just not fitting, nor is it healthy. Well, in the end, I think we can find some great spiritual applications here. One, and the obvious one, don't lie to God. Don't lie to God. I mean, why, who, who would? Well, many do. As if he doesn't see and know everything about our lives to begin with. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle that fits them all. God hates lying. He detests it, actually. The Proverbs and the Psalms. Jesus told us exactly who the originator of lies was. The devil. He is the one that causes you to lie when you are party to it. 
When you sin, it's already bad enough for you. Don't lie about it. Don't drag others into it. Your judgment's even greater if you cause others to stumble. Again, we don't have the Lord doing what he did at that point in the church. Praise God and thank you, Lord. But think about it. At any given time in our lives, would we not qualify for something like this if we really were to think about the stuff that we get our little hands and feet into? Okay, so I know your sin, our sin, may not be so outright, but we can go a little bit deeper here, make it a little personal, a little more application for us. Bringing it back to the two greatest commandments that Jesus quoted, I know we all know a little bit better, and we strive to love our neighbor as ourselves, but let's just say we're okay on that one, okay? But are we loving God? with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Are you holding anything back? I was challenged because this, it was almost seven years ago that we were in the book of Acts and going back to some of my old notes and thinking, you know, there was a time uh, then when this challenged me and I'm being challenged again. And I think we all are challenged at certain times. Are we holding anything back from God? Did you pledge something that you would give to him, you know, financially or just of your life and of your service, of your time? Are you supposed to be signing up? We're going to have children's ministry getting started here soon. You know, the first of the year, you know, after we get through the new year, it's time for us to get to, to get children's ministry back up. Youth group, the, the Aaron needs some young women in there or old women. It doesn't matter. Women. He's in there with a bunch of. He's in there with a bunch of young women. And he's a guy. That was the announcement. It was something on my mind. I couldn't remember what the announcement was. You know, because he talked to me about it this week, and he he does. He needs he needs a woman in there. Gina's helping. That's awesome. But we need more. There's more women in there. They, he can't counsel the young women. They, you know. And there's just issues of propriety and, you know, making sure, you know, boundaries and things like that. So has God stirred in you when he gave the announcement? Is there something that you thought, I could serve, maybe, you know, once a month is all he's asking for. But you'll fall in love with doing it anyway. My wife and I chaperone youth group at our Calvary Chapel for many years, went around the world with these youth group kids on mission trips and stuff. It's, your, your heart will be drawn towards the, towards these kids when you realize the stuff that they're dealing with and struggling, yet they're trying to trying to navigate serving God. Go pour into their lives. What other things of service has God called you to do that you responded to as in your mind or you maybe you showed up and did it once and then just kind of disappeared and faded off? You know, don't give, don't pledge something to the Lord and then not full follow through. Robert Arthington a rich man and investor in England during the 1800s. He was heir to a, a brewery that, that was very successful. His family business had done him well, but he was also very savvy and wise with his uh, finances. He lived, though, in a single room, cooked his own meals, shared his friendship with people who were in need, you know, made sure others had stuff. Yet at the same time, he gave tremendous amounts of money during his lifetime to Christian missions. When he died, his estate was worth about $5 million. And he left it all to missions. Now, this was the 1800s, and he it was worth $5 million. After his death, a letter that he had sent to a missionary was found. Um, it said, were I in England again, I would gladly live in one room, make the floor my bed, a box my chair, another my table, rather than the heathen should perish for lack of knowledge of Jesus Christ. Robert Arthington was determined to make that kind of self-denial the pattern for his life. He was a man who lived in the great grace of God and fear and reverence of God when he thought of the task of getting the gospel to the world. Do we have that kind of mindset? 
Listen, we have a great task set before us as a church in this city. Let's not hold back. Let's not hold back. If you're looking for an excuse, the devil has plenty of reasons for you to keep your tithes. You know, January, because Christmas bills are due. In February, because fuel bills and car keep up. In March, because of upcoming income taxes. In April, because taxes are actually due. In May, because you have to recover after taxes. In June, July, and August, because of vacation expenses coming up and vacation expenses that need to be paid and everything put on the credit card, now the bills are coming in. In September, because, well, school, the children, you know, need things. In October, because the winter's coming and the gas bill goes up. My goodness, I've been freezing. I'm cold now. I, I can't wear my shorts and flip-flops anymore, and I'm cold, and I got the heater on all the time. Our bill came from the gas company. Good old SoCal Gas, which I've always loved for a $25 bill. It's like, oh my goodness, gas apparently is expensive. And then November comes, and, you know, it's time for Thanksgiving, and it's time to start shopping uh, for Christmas. And then in December, because, you know, you got to get all those Christmas presents, and then the cycle begins again. Listen, Ananias, or Hananiah, means God is gracious. Sapphira means beautiful. They did not live up to their names. Satan corrupted the grace of God in their lives, and he turned beautiful giving into ugly, prideful sin. It was the love of money that formed the root of evil in their minds and in their plans. But God loves a cheerful giver, and he loves to bless and give great rewards for those that do. Temporal rewards and, more importantly, eternal You know, it's a message like this. We have to look at all those different angles. Where are you on your service to the Lord? Where are you on your giving to the Lord? You know, I asked my wife to uh, let me know because I don't, just so you know, I, I don't deal with the finances of the church. I go, I go drop off the deposit. I have a general idea, but I don't, I hate it when they can't get a check to go through or there's a mistake on a check. Some people still write Hope Chapel on their checks and every now and then, the bank will catch it, and it's not one of the entities, you know, and then I have to look at it, and I hate doing it. I Honestly, from my heart, I do not like to look at, I don't want to know who gives, especially how much or whatever. It's not in my thing. I, I just don't, okay? But, you know, we give as a church, too. We tithe as a church. We've recently reallocated some of our mission money now because of our friends Vaughn and Heather now they're back in the states because of COVID and they realize that it's going to be a long time before they get back to the Bible college they they took a position as assistant chap, uh, pastor of Calvary Chapel Santa Rosa um, so we had asked them well what about the support and they said uh, it's up to you can you reallocate and we decided you know what we reallocated everything we were giving Vaughn and Heather now is supporting the Bible college in Nepal and three of the young pastors in, that we met um, and served with there. So we're supporting their churches. One guy in the Himalayas, whose church is exploding right now. Okay? They're in the Himalayas. I mean, I want to go there so bad, but it's like a 10-hour hike to get to his village. For him, the guy, the guy weighs a buck five. <laughs> He's 22 years old and weighs like a 110 pounds. Can you imagine me hiking up a mountain into the thin air? I told, uh, Bond, Bond only went there in a helicopter, and I said, I will pay for a helicopter. I want to go, but I will, you know. We've recently reallocated. Uh, this, we, every year I want to have a business meeting, you know, for the church. But, so here's your business meeting for the year. Um, so, because you guys need to know this, it is important because you give, 
uh, our books are wide open here. You can request to see the bank accounts, the books at any time. Give us 24 hours notice to, to get everything printed out. Yeah, we, we well, it's not, it's not like we hit our JP Morgan or something here, but... Um, <laughs> So, but we reallocated with our, our good friends, Amy and Andy, who have been serving with Frontiers uh, in the Middle East, uh, dealing with refugees. Um, they, their support is full, but there's a, the hospital and the stuff that they work with uh, really needed funds to, to, to make sure they have the right medicines and equipment. So we reallocated now to that organization through, through them instead of Frontiers. So we do move things around. But as, as a general rule, we tithe, the church tithes uh, 10%. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Just depends on where we are financially. But we do our best to tithe. And we have, we have others that we give, local outreach, missions, evangelism. It all goes out for the work of the gospel. So that, that, that's just a little bit of, of, you know, how we do it. My wife and I tithe, of course. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. It's one of the kind of an odd, it's weird to me to write a tithe check, but I do. I put it in. I, I, I'm happy to do that. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Some churches, some churches have it automatically taken out of your paycheck. I won't do that. That's just, to me, I don't want it to be just an expense. It's giving to the Lord giving him a, a tithe, a tenth, sometimes more, because we support missionaries as well, ourselves personally. Listen, if this hits home, don't be like Ananias and potentially die spiritually or have an unfulfilled Christian life. Don't be like Sapphira and not confess it when you have the chance. I believe that God has great things that he wants to do and the devil is coming in like a flood in many areas of our lives and in the church. Finances are going to be a weak point for him to infiltrate and exploit if we don't get this lesson today. Again, God has given us his very best. He has given us great grace. Can we strive to give our best back to him in gratefulness and reverence and really have the proper godly fear that we need to have for who he is. And, and again, my heart goes out, and I've been really praying about this and thinking about this, but this newest kind of shutdown um, is very interesting. At some point, what's the old saying? The bow is going to break. There are many people who are, are struggling, and I, I've been just having visions in my mind like, do we need to have meals? Do we need to feed people? Do we need to call the church together two or three times a week and eat a meal together because people are going to have struggle getting food? And those that have, can they bring food? Can we have, I don't know, maybe it's something the Lord's going to want us to do just to make sure everybody has, has a meal and then we'll just pray and, and worship a little bit and maybe we'll just have to do these things. I don't know where this is going. I don't know... Uh, how bad things are going to get. But for now, we're still in God's grace. We're still with him. He's still taking care of us. We're still moving and breathing, eating. Again, if, if you're struggling, just let us know. We haven't unpacked all these bags. Just take them as they are. <laughs> There's plenty of food. Oh, did somebody get the bag of potatoes? There's a bag of potatoes. Yeah, where is it? Excellent. Because somebody brought a bag of potatoes in, and that, those aren't going to last. They're going to just grow into more potatoes. And <laughs> it's non-perishables that we have. If you like spam, go for it. There's nothing wrong with some salt. Um, listen, that, that's, that's the message today. A little time to shore up our lives, understand and be thankful for God's great grace in our lives. But let's, let's follow through with some of those commitments we made to him for service and whatnot. And, and, and if finances hit you today, if, if you had pledged something to the Lord or something, I don't know, just follow through with it. Please, because he just wants to bless you anyway. So let's strive to be pleasing to him with our finances as well as our lives and our service. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have been good. Continue to protect us. Continue to bless this church. Bless your people, Lord. I pray that uh, each and every one of us still has what we need 
but help us be in tune and attentive to what others need. And if that time is coming for us, Lord, please prepare us to do so. Let us not uh, be around this church saying, oh, that's tough, oh, that's hard, oh, people are struggling. Lord, if there's something we can do, make sure that your Holy Spirit has free reign to move upon us and make sure we do it in time and not in desperation, Lord. We ask that you would move in your church, move among your people. We thank you and we praise you once again for who you are and what you have done and what you're continuing to do and what you will do. We ask all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go forth with Christ. We'll see you uh, next week. All righty.